Writing Out Loud, a program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Our hostess for today's program is Teresa Miller, Executive Director for the Oklahoma Center for Poets and Writers at OSU Tulsa. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My very special guest today is Emmy winning reviewer, Ooh. Joel Siegel. <laughs> I am so thrilled that you're here and you've written this wonderful book, oh, Lessons for Dylan. thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. I read that as a, as a movie reviewer for Good Morning America, you see 200 plus films. I do. A year. A year. The wow. good news is, it's I don't have to see the same movie 200 times. Well, that's good. I get to see 200 different movies also. Well, that's good. When I see something I don't like. Do you ever get to go to the movies just for fun? I won't go to the movies just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I do? I'll check my the TV guide and when there's something I'll, and I'll look under black and white and I'll watch old movies just for fun. Mm -hmm. You certainly seem to have a wonderful time on Good Morning America. Oh. How long have you been with the show? 20 years, more 20 than 20 years. years. Is it all as friendly you and You know, it really is, it because when you get to work at four o'clock in the morning, if you're difficult, if you're hard to get along with, if you're a prima donna, they're not gonna let you come to work the next day. I mean, it's just, just as simple as that. It seems like a real family atmosphere. It really is, and they're great people, too. And, it, you know, besides Charlie and, and Diane, the people behind the scenes. Well, it sure seems that way. Yeah. It comes across that way. Sometimes, Joel, I'll go to a movie and I'll have one impression of it, and then maybe I'll see it a year or two later and I'll think differently about that. Of course, you're a professional, but do you ever see a film and then change your opinion of it after a review's been broadcast? <sighs> <laughs> it doesn't happen. I think it's happened twice to me. Can you remember uh, what film? Uh, yeah, a movie Amadeus. Oh, yes. I, I hated it when I saw it. I don't know why I hated it. Uh -huh. Then I thought, it's a great movie. <laughs> <laughs> Is it just the mood we're in sometimes, or maybe life experience uh, that changes our view? Uh, I hope it's not the mood, because I really try to be a professional. Oh, I'm sure you are. Uh, I think... Sometimes the movie gets you and sometimes it doesn't get mm -hmm. you. And movies are movies do that, they envelop you, they're magic. Mm -hmm. And if they don't get you, they don't get you. And I will see a movie a couple of times. If, I think, uh, Cold Mountain, for example. Mm -hmm. I saw Cold Mountain, I hated it. Hated mm -hmm. the movie. Mm -hmm. And I figured, no, it can't be that bad. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then I went to see it again. And I loved it. And it was just, it didn't get me the first time around. I don't know why. Do you ever, ever have to go back to a third time to resolve the conflict? <laughs> <laughs> I will see Cold Mountain. I, I will see it again. The movies that could. I hope not. Uh, when I see four or five movies a week. That's 200 movies a year. That's a lot of time at the movies, and I really don't have time to see a, a movie as many times as I would like. Also, something Lord of the Rings uh, yeah. was very difficult. It was yeah. very complicated. Yeah. Uh, I saw that twice also before I, I finished my review. And then every once in a while there's a movie like, believe it or not, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen it since I was a little boy. They released, re-released it, I watched it. I saw it twice in the same day, something I'd never done again, because I couldn't believe it was that good. It mm -hmm. really is that great. Mm -hmm. It's story, simple storytelling boiled down to its most basic. And here's a great Snow White story. When it ran, it opened a Radio City uh -huh. Music Hall. Nelson Rockefeller, as a summer job, the family, you know, was part of the family Rockefeller Center. He was a kid. He ran Radio City Music Hall that summer. And he complained to the Disney people. The kids got so scared that every two weeks they had to put in all new seats in the theater. Isn't that amazing? That's right. <laughs> That's the power of film. Yes, it is. <laughs> Do any of your viewers ever take issue with you on reviews? How often does that happen? Uh, you know, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, and it's only happened once in my entire career that an actor that's what has I was going to do. Only, really, only I think they know. Yeah. Yeah. No. Not to, can you tell us yeah. who the actor was? Should I tell you who the actor yeah, is? Yeah. We won't tell anyone. Dudley Moore. No kidding. And that really surprised me because I'd never given him a bad review. I just yeah. didn't like his movies, and I said things about. It's like suddenly he became a star, and he wasn't expecting to be a star. And they were paying him millions and millions of dollars, and he would do anything for that kind of money. And I mm -hmm. said, Well, there's, we have a name for people who will do anything for that, you know, for money, and perhaps, well. Well, we wouldn't have to go on, but he, he was offended. 
how's the role of movies changed since uh, they first came about? Uh, do we look to them in the same way today? Oh no, I think when movies first started it was a novelty and it was exciting and it was you saw things you never expected to see. The very first time movies were shown to, projected films were shown to an audience, it was in New York City at a place called Coster and Biles Music mm -hmm. Hall, which is where Macy's is today. And we can just imagine when they were shown on a sheet, because no one had invented the movie screen, and it was, of course, black and white, and it was kind of rickety photography. Yeah, yeah. It got, and one of the short films was Waves Breaking at Coney Island. That was the title. Mm -hmm. The film is lost, but we can mm -hmm. imagine what it was. The sure. guy stood on the beach and doing it. When audiences saw the water coming, they screamed and ran out of the theater. They were afraid they were going to get wet. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Not only do you review uh, movies, you have also reviewed books for the LA Times. You're a writer yourself. Got a Tony nomination. That's pretty yeah. darn good. Wrote the book to the first, the, uh, the Broadway musical about, about Jackie yeah, Robinson. Yeah, it's a yeah. great, great thing. What's it like for you as a writer when your own work is reviewed? <laughs> I'm just curious. Uh, Do you ever take issue with your reviewers? No, I don't. And uh, I haven't read any negative reviews of my book, which oh, may good. be because I've been protected from them. But I find it very interesting. I find it interesting what people get out of it and what people don't get out of it. Do you get nervous about what kinds of reviews you're going to get? No. You've no. learned to put it all in perspective. Absolutely. And there are some actors who say, I never read reviews, and they don't. Really? Yeah. But you read your reviews? I read some, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. Let's talk about your great new book, uh, Lessons for Dylan. Why did you decide to write this book? It just a, a series of, of coincidences that I was trying to come to grips with. Mm -hmm. I became a father at 55. I was, when, and we found out, and it wasn't easy, we had to go through in vitro. Mm -hmm. And I'm very honest about it. This is like, uh, Ellen DeGeneres and uh, Anne Heche were on the show. Mm -hmm. And I was telling them, I, I, I said, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't care what's going on in your life, but we just had a baby who's the greatest thing in the world. And, right. and, and it was very difficult. We had to go, you know, had to mm -hmm. go through in vitro. And I told Anne, and she said, well, you know, if we had a baby, it couldn't be a surprise. And I said, well, same thing with us. We mm -hmm. had to go through in vitro. And because it's the 21st century, I said, it was because of me, because I have a low sperm count. And mm -hmm. she instantly said, not as low as Ellen's. So, <laughs> That's right. That's good. Uh, we found out we were pregnant, and two weeks to the day, I found out I had colon cancer, mm -hmm. and did checked on the web, and there was a seventy percent chance that I would be around to see Dylan born. Mm -hmm. I had surgery, and the cancer was more advanced than they had anticipated, and my odds dropped to sixty percent. And I wanted Dylan to know who I was, and I wanted him to be able to tell who he is, and that's why I wrote the book. Were you ever overwhelmed by the immensity of what you needed to tell, Dylan? Well, and you're a writer, and you know that there's something about the process of writing that distances you from the mm -hmm. reality. Mm -hmm. One of the great things that, that helped me mm -hmm. survive this time, after the colon cancer, it moved to this lung, I lost half of this lung, then it moved to this lung, I lost a third of this lung, is denial. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you just, you, you have to be able to do some of that. You can't let the cancer consume your psyche the way it's trying to consume your body. And when you sit and you write, you get distance. I talk about being a reporter, it's a reporter syndrome. I have done things as a reporter I would never do as a human being. I'm afraid of heights. I really uh -huh, am uh -huh, afraid of heights. Uh -huh. And I have, for years, I covered dropping the ball at Times Square. And I would stand on the ledge. I would sit with my tushy three quarters of the way over the ledge. And I, I would look down. Yeah. As, as Joel Siegel, you know, frightened human being, I would never do that. But there's somehow this invulnerability as a reporter that you feel, and it's true as a writer, too. Yeah. One of the things that, that I liked, I liked the personal touch, Dear Dylan. You know, it gets <laughs> very, very, it, it much in the letter format, which is nice, so we know clearly that you're addressing the yeah. book to him. And right from the beginning, you write very candidly about your cancer. Why was it important to be so frank about, about your disease? I think it's very personal reasons, but, in, but, but it's also historic reasons. Uh, the problem with cancer is that it attacks in ugly places. Mm -hmm. if you, I think if we all got cancer or the dimple, mm -hmm. 
yes. or cancer. Oh, I have to go get my elbow checked yes. because it. Yes. But it doesn't. It comes in the breast and the colon and the testicles and terrible places and places you don't want to talk about. Colon cancer. There's a there are a number of genes that you inherit a proclivity toward cancer. You may even inherit the cancer gene itself. They're not certain. And I found out in the recovery room after my surgery that three of my mother's first cousins had colon cancer. Because when I grew up, nobody said, not only did no one say colon, no one said cancer, it was cancer. Yeah, exactly. And we have to de demystify it. We, we just have to. Had I known before, I would have been checked up earlier, and there's no excuse for anyone to die of colon cancer, because if <laughs> they find it, it's gone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This wasn't your first experience with cancer. Your first wife uh, died of the disease. Right. And your good friend Gilda Radner. Tell us yeah. about the, the foundation that you're on that well, carries her name. Well, it's something that's called Gilda's Club, and uh -huh. we are in about 15 cities. I think the closest that we're in Dallas, Fort Worth, is mm -hmm. very, and someone should start one here in Tulsa. It's a place for people with cancer to go where you're not the only one in the room. Mm -hmm. And it's not medical cure, it's not a cure, it's just social support for people with cancer and their families. Uh, my wife Jane had a brain tumor and it, uh, the meeting with Gilda happened when it was a, a Broadway opening mm -hmm. and Jane came back from using the ladies room at intermission and said, Gilda Radner knows who I am. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I, I was, we're waiting in line in the same line together and I introduced myself. And she said, oh, everybody knows Joel Siegel's wife always wears a headband. And I told her why. Mm -hmm. And she wore a headband because she had had brain surgery uh, she was bald, she wore a wig, and the headband hid the wig line. Mm -hmm. And they became friendly. And Jane asked me for a place to go where she could meet with other people who had cancer. Because no matter how much you love someone or how much you care about someone, when they have cancer, there's, there's a room that you cannot go in. Mm -hmm. it, it's just true. And I figured that would be the easiest thing in the world. And I used all of, I mean, one of the things about being a celebrity, Gene Wilder said this when you, they'll answer the phone. <laughs> you can call almost anybody, and if you're a celebrity, they'll answer the phone. That's right. And I, and I made all the calls I could, and it didn't exist. There wasn't a place to go. And Gilda found a place in Los Angeles. And after she died, I got in touch with Jean, and we commiserated the way spouses of people who die way too early, you know, knowing things that only we would know. And he said, you know, I promised Gilda that I would Move, put a place like that in New York. So we got together, and that's and Gilda's Club is the is what happened. Of course, you never dreamed at the time that you would have cancer yourself. No. <laughs> I mean, there's so many ironies in the book. I love the story about when you're walking down the street, you get a call on your cell phone that your MRI is clear, <laughs> and then you go buy Dylan a cashmere sweater and for, he's his, only for his second birthday. Second birthday. What <laughs> kind of idiot buys a cashmere sweater for? His <laughs> but did, did, did discovering you had cancer suddenly changed your whole world. All these incongruities consistencies and ironies emerged. Yeah. Well, I found I was standing on Fifth Avenue in front of, I think it was called Luxury Gap. I mean, a store so insane they don't have them anymore. Uh -huh. It's for cra probably crazy parents and grandparents. And I write in the book that if I'd been standing in front of the Mercedes place, I would have gone and bought Gildan a Mercedes for his second birthday. <laughs> and then the next day I found out I got the oops <laughs> phone oh, call. Yeah. And it was in this lung. How do you learn to live with those ups and downs? I don't know. I think by only seeing the up. Uh, I'm very positive. I'm a positive person. And when I was diagnosed, my immediate reaction is, okay, what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And the prognosis is good now. Yeah, prognosis seems to be excellent. Uh, I'm here. You're here. You, you're I'm happy. Here. You're living a yeah. full life. Yeah. You know, it's like I wake up in the morning, and I wake up in the morning. What more can you ask for? Not and much. I and I'm watching Dylan grow up, and it's a. I mean, everybody with kids knows it's a miracle every day. And you're sharing that miracle with all of us in the book. We learned a lot about your social values. You're a social <laughs> activist, oh. active in the civil rights <laughs> movement. Actually, got to, to meet Martin Luther King. Yeah. This is. I, you know, thinking about this, that to me, this is the most important thing. It's not necessarily that I want Dylan to know, but I want my grandchildren and great grandchildren sure. will know. And just thinking about how much America has changed and how much the world has changed since the '60s and how important those changes. Just looking at Dylan and looking at his friend. I took him to a movie, mm -hmm. which I do on occasion, <laughs> Young Black Stallion, which is a, well, okay, it was on IMAX and it was a right. Christmas movie. And it takes place in North Africa. 
And the opening scene is gorgeous, it's really beautiful uh, scenery. And there's four Arabs, black robes mm -hmm. on beautiful ho white horses. One of them has a falcon on his arm. And they stop, and the guy with the falcon swipes the falcon away and says, Yella! And Dylan, who's sitting on my lap, turns to me and he says, that's how you say hurry up in Arabic. <laughs> how did he do What a great country. Where yeah. else does a Jewish kid know how to say hurry up? And, and <laughs> going back to the civil rights movement, we have, we, we, we've to understand that we're all people and we're all exactly. in this together. And uh, so it was a Jesse Jackson line. Some came on a slave ship, some on an immigrant ship, some on the Mayflower, but we're all in the same boat now. And it's, to me, it's like, I'm just so proud of what I was able to do. It's like guys who fought, who landed in Normandy on D-Day. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something, we did it because it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how kids are gonna understand that segregation ever had. It doesn't, it's, it's mm -hmm. insane, it doesn't make any sense. I and mean, it truly doesn't. It doesn't make any sense in their own lives. And, it, no, it doesn't. No. And kids point that out initially. Yeah. How did you get to be a joke writer for Bobby Kennedy? Well, <laughs> I had a joke. I knew Frank Mankiewicz, uh -huh. uh, whose father wrote Citizen Kane. And I knew Frank through friends in L.A. I was working in an ad agency. And when Bobby Kennedy decided he was going to run, I was, this is something else writers get to do, I was living on unemployment insurance in between jobs. <laughs> I'm familiar and, with that. <laughs> I'm familiar with yeah. it. And I called Frank and I said, uh, I love Bobby, I'll do anything I can. By the way, I have a joke. Now this is 1968, so Lyndon Johnson is president and George Hamilton is dating oh, I remember Linda that. Bird. I remember that, yeah. So Frank says, what's the joke? And I say, Bobby says, I know my campaign is starting to move because yesterday George Hamilton called for my daughter's phone number. Got a big laugh. I told that story in <laughs> Omaha, Nebraska, which is not far from uh -huh. here. And some guy in the audience went, yeah! And it turns out he had been in Indianapolis working for Bobby when Bobby came yeah. in and said, I just heard this great joke. Yeah. And, it, and it was my joke. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that had to make you just feel well. Of course, it, it, of and, course. And, and, and the laughter that came with it. And, and you knew the Beatles. I have met all, the, which that really impresses Dylan, who's a Beatles fan. Oh, is he a Beatles yeah, fan? Yeah, he's a big Beatles fan, which it beats the heck out of listening to Barney when you're sitting, when you're, when you're driving in the car. Oh, that's he's a big, big Beatles fan. So much, there's two stories I have to tell yeah. about Dylan. And, and just, and they're not unique to Dylan. He's, a, he's not the world's greatest kid. He's a kid. Kids are just, it's, it's a miracle. It really is uh -huh. a miracle. We want Yom Kippur services. It's the holiest day in the Jewish year. And, and there's a memorial service. And part of the service is people stand up and recite the names of people who died during the past year. It's a mm -hmm. memorial, it's a remembrance. So Dylan says to me, so who are these people? And I explain what they were. And I said, these are people who died that these people want to remember. And he says, are they going to say John Lennon's name? And I said, I don't think so, but we could say a little prayer for John Lennon and, uh -huh. and let him know how much we miss him and how much we love him. And then he said, and George Harrison too. <laughs> And that's what, that's, that's good. I did a piece 10 years ago when ABC ran Beatles Anthology. They sent me to England. Mm -hmm. And I found one of the stories, and I'm very excited I'm going to show Dylan. So there I am in Liverpool. I'm at Penny Lane, and I'm at Strawberry Fields. And then it cuts back to me, and it's 10 years ago, and my hair is out to here. I'm wearing funny glasses, and he's laughing. And Dylan knows I'm an, he doesn't know I'm an, he knows I'm an older father, and he knows I've, you know, I have older father's problems. Like, I can't remember much, and I forget stuff. So he hears me say, coming back, he says, we all have strong memories of the first time we saw the Beatles. And he looks up at me and says, you don't have a strong memory anymore. <laughs> <laughs> he sounds like a great kid. He may be a reviewer. You think he's going to follow in your footsteps? I, do, I, I just want him to do what he what makes him happy. And, uh, and of course, you know, as a parent, I just want, you know, whatever there's a passion for, whatever he wants to do, it's fine. One of my favorite chapters in the book is when you talk about the films you want to see with Dylan. What's first on your list? Of course, you've already seen Yeah, we've several. already seen a lot of films. Uh, I think the one I can't wait to see with Dylan is To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. It's a great because, movie, isn't it? And as a, for a father to watch it with their child, when the woman says to, he says, stand up, your daddy's passing. Oh. 
That's a, uh, is that one of your all-time favorites? Oh, Would you sure. Have to say? That's Absolutely. in your top ten yeah. list. We've been talking about movies, and we've got to ask about the Oscars. Why is it we get so excited about the opening of envelopes, even in times of war? <laughs> I mean, we've got lots going on, and I, I can't think of anything you know the else. Reason, you know the real reason? Well, no, what is because it? it doesn't count. I really do think so. That's Thought it. about it hard. Uh -huh. No matter who wins or who loses, nobody's taxes are going to go up. Nobody's going to be, you know, sent off, you know, the other half of the world to fight a war. I really do think that's why. It's fun. And it's fun for us. Mm -hmm. Here oh, we are, yeah. civilians. These are the richest, most beautiful people in the world. And four out of five of them are going to lose. And, <laughs> and that's, that's fun, I, too. I hadn't even thought about it in that way. When you're around people like that, and you meet, as part of your job, all these celebrities, yeah, yeah. I mean, the Beatles, and then political activists like Martin Luther King, do you ever meet people that you're just absolutely in awe of? That Rosa you're Parks. Rose, oh, yeah. Tell yeah. us what that was like. I walked into the green room at Good Morning America, and it was Rosa Parks sitting oh, there. Oh, gosh. And I write this in the book to Dylan, and I, and I said, excuse me, Mrs. Parks, but could I get you a cup of coffee? Because I would like to be able to tell my grandchildren one day that I got Rosa Parks a cup of coffee. <laughs> uh, as most of the celebrities, even, but they're pretty good people, and surprisingly good people. Tom Cruise, mm -hmm. what a good guy he is. First time I met Tom Cruise was in the green room of Good Morning America. He just made his first movie. He was a uh -huh. kid. He grew up, he went to military school, and it was yes, ma'am, yes, sir, and very polite, and he is still that way. Nicole Kidman, not only is, I mean, look, she looks like she swallowed a light bulb. She glows <laughs> yeah, inside. She I mean, she, and she <laughs> is so unbelievably beautiful, and she's tall. She's taller than you think. She is so nice and so easygoing. I met her before the Oscars last year. She was at a party with, and she brought her folks from Australia. Oh. And her folks are not elegant, fancy people. Mm -hmm. They're just mm -hmm. folks. <laughs> and it, it's just great to see. Any predictions on the 2004 Oscars? Can you give us a couple? Oh, sure. I think uh, it's going to be big movies. And I think it's there's a three-way way race between three movies I liked a lot, Cold Mountain, Mystic River, and Lord of the Rings, and I think, right now, this morning, mm -hmm. I think they're gonna go with Lord of the Rings for Best Picture, Peter Jackson for Best Director, and the other movies will take other uh, Oscars. Renee Zellweger will win for Supporting Actress. She was extraordinary, wasn't she? Yeah. She, no, she's somebody else. She is off camera, she's shy. Really? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Nothing at all like that character she plays. Oh, and then in Chicago, the character she plays yeah, out there is yeah, so she's out there. really, really a good actress. And uh, for Mystic River, I think Sean Penn will win Best Actor. What about Best Actress? That's... Is that a tougher call? Well, it's a tougher call because Diane Keaton is wonderful in this movie, uh, the, the romantic comedy with, with Jack Nicholson. But... And there's a film here. I don't think that's, uh, that's played in Tulsa yet called Monster. It's just coming. Sh Charlize Theron is unbelievable. I've heard that's film. one of the best yeah. performances by an actress ever. It could be. It could be. Especially when you, her other movie this year was The Italian Job. And she's gorgeous. And she really is. She gained 35 pounds. She, they did some, put some kind of makeup on her face. It makes her face, mm -hmm. her skin modeled. Mm -hmm. uh, phony... Uh, prosthetic teeth that gives her a terrible overbite, and but it's not the transformation outside; it's the transformation inside that she manages to achieve. Just extraordinary. Do the do the winners reflect our social values as well? We were talking about the roles of movies in popular culture, and the fact that the, you think Lord of the Rings is going yeah. to, to win this year. Does that reflect where we are right now? I don't think the winners do so much as what. Uh, how films do really well at the box office. The Oscars are like, there are 4,000 people who vote, and it's difficult getting a handle on who those people are. For a while, critics complained that, oh, they were, they're just only old people. And then suddenly we looked around and we realized, well, there aren't many people older than we are. So, <laughs> so, so that's not true. But I think, yeah, the fact that Lord of the Rings is done very, very well, and it's interesting, it did well now, and it did well in the 60s, mm -hmm. it answers a need for people to find a mythology to live by because the real world isn't so easy. I think when comedies do well, uh, it means that times are good, people aren't afraid to laugh. Yeah, I think that that's true. This is, we vote at the box office. Yeah. 
you know, you, we talk about commercial successes, and we, we so far have talked about commercial successes that are also very good films. Are you sometimes dumbfounded at the, why certain movies do so well? Oh, yeah. Can you give us, can you give us an example of what well, it is? Like, why are people paying bucks to go yeah, to this in a hard economy? Yeah. Uh, there's a movie called American Wedding that's doing yes, very well and yes. hugely well on DVD, and it's as close, to me, it's like as close to pornography as the studios could get. It's just... It says terrible things about people and terrible things about the way men treat women and women treat men, and it's just a dirty movie. And uh, I'm sad that a movie like that does that well. You've had such a versatile career. Rumor has it that you actually uh, invented strawberry cheesecake ice cream. I did. You did. Now, that, listen, did. that's an accomplishment. <laughs> also, pralines and cream, which no is... Kid. Now, no. how, do, how do you invent an ice cream? I was, the, I was working at an advertising agency, my first job out of college in Los Angeles, and one of the clients was Baskin Robbins, and one of the assignments we got every year was to invent ice cream flavors. And those are the ones I invented. <laughs> also, well, German chocolate cake ice cream. Oh, well, listen, hey. they're, they're some of my favorites. <laughs> Why did you choose those particular ones? I love ice cream. <laughs> you other pe yeah, other people were making up ice cream with funny names, and have I was you, making up ice cream. I wanted a taste. Have you had to change your diet any uh, since you, you learned that yeah. you had cancer? Because yeah. I mean, you have all these wonderful Jewish recipes in the book. You want to pass <laughs> your, your heritage on to Dylan. Have you had to modify, cut back on the ice cream and some of the some of <laughs> yeah, the Jewish recipes? Yeah, yeah, I, find I have to I have to eat less when I have dietary problems, and yeah, it's, it comes with the territory. I lost a foot and a half of colon, and I don't function the way people are supposed to function. But I function. <laughs> That's you the book You do function, news. and beautifully. And I'm wondering, this is a great book. You have so many things in it. Is, is there more to say to Dylan? He's six now, right? Well, I figure that, well, what's happening now is that there are things that Dylan is going to, <laughs> is going to tell me. His first day of school, he calls us by our first names. He calls me Joe, yeah. Joel, calls his mother yeah. Ina. And once I said, you know, Dylan, everybody calls me Joel. You know, you're the only person in the world who could call me daddy. And he said, okay, Joe. <laughs> his first day of school, he's walking home from school and he looks up at his mom and he says, Ina, are God and Mother Nature married? That's a great one. Is <laughs> thank you, Joe, for being here today. Well, thank you, Ina. No, Teresa. <laughs> Congratulations on this terrific book, Lessons for Dylan. And thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud.